Good morning, everyone. Today we are going to continue um, the project scope management uh, chapter. Um, we have uh, stopped until the collection of requirement. Uh, today we are going to continue. We're going to continue the uh, remaining four processes. So the third process was is defining scope. Uh, project scope statement is a, a very important um, part of uh, the the project. Um, it should have a product scope de description, and yani you should describe what is it that you're going to do uh, in terms of yani is, is it the, the product or or a service that you're going to provide. Okay. Uh, it also give information about how the users are going to accept this uh, yani what are the criteria that you have to meet in this scope in order to uh, your users will accept this or the owner will accept this product okay or service uh, and also the uh, scope statement should also include information on all the project deliverables Okay, and it has to be detailed. Okay, so if it's um, a phone, smartphone, then you should give the details of the features that the smartphone will have. Okay, and like this. Now, these are the minimum. These are the least things that you have to include in a, any scope statement. If you can add the following, will be also better. For example, if you uh, yani, uh, add more documents uh, about the scope which gives more information that's also something uh, good these documents can or yani, it can be also part of the yani, no need to be a separate document in the same document uh, you can uh, provide more information such as the boundaries we talked about this earlier now and that this is our boundary we're going to develop this system for the accounting department not for the hr okay so you, you put the, the boundaries so uh, it will not be confused because some people say okay but payroll is part of hr and you are going to cover it in the financial system so this means that you are going to cover hr no you are going only to cover all the cycles of the financial processes or the accounting processes and we are going to handle only the payroll uh, part because it, yeah it will come from hr but we are not going to cover the whole hr cycle okay so this is uh, the boundaries also you have the uh, constraints if you have any constraints at constraining the uh, the project you should also include it any assumptions any uh, something related to the culture, something assumptions related to uh, the, the um, technology availability, the taste of the customers, whatever, you, you also need to provide here. Uh, in some cases, you need to refer to other uh, documents like supporting documents, like uh, a contract. I mean, this project is part of a, a bigger contract with with the uh, client that we are going to develop this project and then we go to another project so uh, in this project you are not going you are not going to discuss the uh, broader um, uh, document uh, agreed upon related to what you are going to do with this organization you are just focusing on this project but there are some documents that will show for example the complete uh, suite that you are going to develop after uh, finishing this project and yani now we'll start with the with financial system in the accounting department then you will uh, do another project uh, which, which will be a separate project which will be for the hr another project will be for the marketing okay. so that's another another document you can refer to it uh, just to to know uh, the, the big picture but the scope statement should only focus on this project also, there are some uh, documents like the um, uh, 
product specification, not just the contracts, also specification. For example, um, if you are upgrading uh, the uh, hard uh, servers of, uh, of an organization. Now, you, um, the servers need more specification about the speed, the power, and all these capacities. So you cannot put them all in this uh, scope statement. You can refer to a brochure or a specification document which gives the details of all of these, the power needed, uh, any, all these frequencies or whatever, but um, it's technical uh, information, it will be there. So you can also refer in the scope statement, you can refer to these um, uh, documents, okay? Um, um, the, the scope statement is progressing throughout time. So what happens is that it starts little vague, uh, if you remember earlier, we talked about this, that about the scope. Uh, and then, by time, things become more clear. Why? Because we start gathering information, gathering uh, yani, uh, requirements, and we also gather other informations like the price uh, and the technical uh, issues of uh, implementing or fixing or whatever. So, by time, things become more clear. And when it's become more clear and more specific, your scope statement should be also revised in order to show this big, bigger understanding, okay, or big, bigger knowledge that you get about the scope. Let me show you an example here. Now, this is a project charter, okay? And in this project charter, this is, this is in the beginning of the project, okay? It's very, and it's not the complete project charter, just part of it. If you look at here, where is the scope statement? And there's no scope statement, but there is the project objectives. Now, if you read these three lines, what information do you get from this? Upgrade hardware and software for all employees, approximately 2,000 employees, within nine months based on new corporate standards. Okay, see attached sheet describing the new standards. Okay, then upgrades may affect servers as well as associated network hardware and uh, software. So upgrade hardware, okay, now we know that we are going to have an upgrade for hardware and software. What is it exactly? I don't know, but for all employees. Okay, and this will take nine months, and we should follow the standards, okay, the corporate standards. There are new standards you have to follow. And there is a chance that we might, we upgrade these servers, okay? So, do we know how many servers we are going to Actually, we say that the upgrade might affect the server, so we, we might yani, upgrade the server. So still, we are not sure. We are going. Are we going to upgrade the servers or not? Uh, or this effect will only include upgrading, or maybe also adding more servers or reducing the number of servers. We don't know. Okay. Uh, so what? Also, what kind of servers? Which servers that are going to be affected? We don't know. So here in the beginning, we don't have that much of information. We, we the, the one thing that we know that the upgrade will affect the servers. How we, we don't know. Later on in this project, when um, you sit with the uh, users and you get the the information and the uh, requirements that they want for the upgrade, then things become more clearer. Then you'll have another version of this project scope. Okay, the statement. So here, you will find something like this. In the beginning, if you look at this, in the, in the top here, this, is, this was the first one. You know, remember, the um, upgrade may affect servers la, from the previous screen. So this was the objectives based on the project, project charter. Now, after sitting with the, with the users and getting more information, now you have a dedicated uh, section um, or heading for the servers. Now, look at this. If additional servers are required, now we know that uh, there might be some additional, okay? Okay, to support this project, they must be compatible with existing servers. So now we know, we have now more information that any server that you're going to bring, it has to be compatible with the existing servers. Okay, if it is more economical to enhance existing servers, 
a detailed description of enhancement must be submitted to the CIO, CIO for approval. Now, also, if it is economical to enhance them instead of uh, buying new ones, okay, then we just need to give more information about this, okay? Uh, then uh, the the information provided here is the uh, current any yani server specification. It's already placed there, and it's attachment number six, okay? And we know that the approval of CEO must have yani be seek before uh, yani implementing this plan okay and there's some information about also the timeline now after had more uh, meetings with the uh, users and contacting the vendors and yani having look at the servers now things become bad more clear so now we have another version version 2 and here look at this it says here this project will require the Gabriel Gulch, you know, in the beginning, it says if additional servers required, okay. Now it says will require purchasing 10 new servers. Now you are not just having servers, but we know the number also exactly. We need 10 servers, okay, to support what web network, database, application, and printing functions. It's not just all, all, only the number of the servers, but also we had. A clear picture of what areas this uh, the, these servers will um, serve. So they will serve the web network, database, application, and printing functions. So you can see how things are more clear by time. When time passes throughout the project. Also, it's not just like this. They are also talking about virtualization will be used to maximize efficiency. So they are, are going to do virtualization between servers so that they don't need to have a separate uh, server for each of these functions. They can uh, share the servers using the uh, virtualization. Uh, and also, they have detailed description of the servers. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, details, descriptions of the servers are provided in a product brochure in Appendix 8, along with a plan describing where they will be located. Yani, even they they mentioned now the brochure, the project, uh, the product brochure of the servers, and not just this, also a plan which shows where they are going to locate each of these servers. See how the details now. If you read the first one here, upgrades may affect server. See, may affect servers. Now look at the end here. So this is the progression that we talked about earlier when we talked about projects and how it, it starts vague and then it continues to become more clear. Okay. And yeah, we already covered this. Okay. Now, the fourth process is creating the work breakdown structure, the WBS. We always refer to it as WBS. Now, the WBS is uh, a division of the, the the whole task into smaller tasks and the aim of this is to make the um, the work uh, oriented with the deliverables so what happens here is that uh, you you define the scope and then you start subdividing we call this the decompositioning you decomp decompose or you subdivide the project deliverables into smaller pieces. So here, uh, you relate the scope to the to the deliverables, and then you um, relate the task that you're going to do to these deliverables by subdividing the deliverables and subdividing the tasks. Okay, so it become any breaking this big task into smaller tasks uh, that you can uh, work on, and uh, decompositioning. Uh, can happen onto uh, different levels. Yeah, you can break it down, and then you can also break it more, so you can have more subs, uh, so levels of subs. And uh, until you reach to a very low level, we call this the work package. And this is the smallest task that you can assign it to a person. Okay. Uh, after agreeing and approving this WBS. This will be your baseline. 
the scope baseline okay and uh, it will be well because things are listed in this uh, any in this kind of uh, let's say um, tabular form or a kind of like a hierarchy drawn on the chart um it, we have only like names you know any uh, two or three words just to describe the task this is not sufficient to understand what is uh, required from you as a team member to what to do to get, to accomplish this task therefore we create something called the work breakdown struct, uh, structure dictionary yeah, you can see here at the end wbs dictionary okay we'll come to that later so this is a sample of uh, a wbs for an intranet okay and how it was uh, divided and th these are two forms this is called the chart form and this is called the tabular form okay it's the same how you represent it so you can, you can see here this is the internet project and it was subdivided so this is level one then you have level two level three is also subdividing any the, here it shows only for the concept uh, so you can see here that these are the subtasks for the concept then they took also one of this in level three defined requirements and they show you also here how did they decompose it or subdivide it okay Similarly here, you, the, they also uh, put them in this form and they have these numbering so that you know exactly, okay? Now, we have a video here. I'll display it, uh, see, uh, about, I mean, it, it will explain the work breakdown structure for you. Okay. In this video, I want to answer the question, what is a work breakdown structure, or WBS? The work breakdown structure is quite simply a tool that breaks the work down into a structure. Let's say a little bit more about this, though. The work breakdown structure is the principal tool that articulates a scope on our project, and it does so in a highly structured way. At its simplest, we take the entire work of the project, the project itself, and we break that down into a number of substantial chunks. We then take each of those chunks of work and we further break it down to its principal components. And each of those principal components gets further broken down until we end up at the lowest level of the hierarchy with individual tasks or activities that the person who will carry them out recognises as a single coherent task that they fully understand. Now, the representation I've put on the screen is very useful for understanding the work breakdown structure but it's absolutely rubbish for representing it across a large project. It will just rapidly get out of hand. And so what we actually do is we number across the principal activities. And then for each thing that flows from those activities, we give it a sub numbering system. So we end up with a comprehensive list of every activity that needs to be done, the scope of the project. And the proper way to plan projects is to develop your work breakdown structure before you start thinking about dependencies and sequence, which will, of course, give you your network chart, or elapsed times for each of the tasks, which will allow you to draw up your Gantt chart. The best way to produce a simple work breakdown structure if you're working on a small project is with a word processor tool like Microsoft Word. If, on the other hand, you're working on a larger, more rigorous project, then you will no doubt have some form of project management software that will allow you to capture every activity, allocate unique reference numbers to them, and create your work breakdown structure as a preliminary step to producing your network chart, your critical path, and your Gantt chart. Tools such as Microsoft Project are designed to do this. 
a good web breakdown structure will be MEECE, M-E-C-E. And that stands for mutually exclusive and completely exhaustive. That is to say, mutually exclusive, each task is clearly distinct from each other task. There is no overlap between the tasks and completely exhaustive means that everything you need to do on your project is covered on your work breakdown structure. The thing that many project managers miss out of their work breakdown structure are all the tasks and activities concerned with managing the project. So as a matter of habit, I will always create one work stream, one major area of work on my work breakdown structure labeled project management. That way I capture all the tasks it takes to manage the project. And then when I start budgeting the project and allocating resources, I have those tasks ready to budget and resource. And that ensures that I don't forget the project management activities and I've got the budget and the resources to carry them out properly. And I'm going to end with what is sometimes perceived as a bit of a rant. It's about the difference between the UK approach to work breakdown structures on the one hand and the US approach on the other. Neither is right, but here's the rant bit. One of them is a little bit more right than the other. So, in the UK, our work breakdown structure is written as a set of activities or tasks. If you're a linguist, then you can think of them as written with verbs. The US approach is to break down the work by breaking down the deliverables or the products of your project. So at the top level, you have the completed project and at subsequent levels below, you have more and more detailed descriptions and smaller components of the product set you need to create. In the UK, we would call that a product breakdown structure. Both of them will give you the right results. So why do I prefer the UK approach? Well, because it's a work breakdown structure that breaks down the work. If you want a product breakdown structure, and oftentimes you will, then you can create a product breakdown structure in parallel. And because a Gantt chart and a network chart are about activities, to me, it makes more sense to develop a work breakdown structure in terms of activities or work. But Whichever approach you choose to adopt, my tip is to adopt one approach and not to try to mix the two. That way lies madness. So a work breakdown structure is a simple, powerful tool that far too many project managers put to one side and don't apply. It's a tool that enables you to fully articulate your scope of work. If you've enjoyed this video, please give it a If you want to see more, please subscribe. Okay, so I think this was helpful. Okay, so <clears throat> let's continue. Uh, I, I will also uh, share this link uh, in the content so you can look at it. So here, this is what he was uh, talking about, is that when you are using um, a software like Microsoft Project, you will add all these uh, um, tasks and then it will create for you a Gantt chart where you can see um, the dependencies between these tasks. Now, to develop the work breakdown structure, there are uh, different approaches. Uh, in some organizations, they follow guidelines, and this is one, one, one way or one approach, that organizations uh, have some kind of guidelines, and they, you have to follow these in order to prepare the work breakdown structure. 
uh, other organizations they follow the analogy approach which looks at a similar project that you done earlier and you try to copy it okay uh, the third is the top down approach and this starts with the largest item and then you break it down them to smaller uh, tasks uh, the uh, fourth is uh, the bottom up approach and the bottom up approach is the opposite of the top down you start uh, putting the uh, very specific tasks uh, and then you try to kind of like roll them up you uh, group them and summarize them until you reach to the top um, and yeah, this is a way of um, developing the work breakdown structures and the last one is the mind mapping approach and the mind mapping approach is a technique that uses branches radiating from uh, the core idea that you have like you have the um, the project name or the task that you are going to uh, accomplish and then you start radi radiating uh, branches uh, about the ideas or anything anything that's related to this um, here you have an example for example here is the IT upgrade project this is in the middle this is the idea then when you start uh, branching you have project management you have install hardware and software and it's, all these are included in this okay upgrade inventory acquire hardware and software and here you can see that when you come to the upgrading of the inventory you also can branch it to performing the physical inventory and updating the database but also here the physical inventory can be also bad and branch to uh, building a building b building c and like this similarly here for the hardware servers and user hardware laptops desktops. so you can see you can uh, branch and radiate many branches of this another video here uh, let's have a look at it for uh, which will explain also the mind mapping concept Hello, I'm Eileen Twitchell and a senior trainer and consultant with the Corporate Education Group. Mind mapping is an effective brainstorming technique that any manager can use with their team to organize information, gather requirements, make decisions, or plan. Our minds are not linear, so mind mapping is a great way to stimulate the entire brain and allow it to jump around naturally. Since the right side of the brain is more creative and big picture oriented, the left side of the brain is more analytical and logical, mind mapping enables people to have to both. The concept of mind mapping is to build an interactive diagram that is interconnected, as opposed to a stagnant list of ideas that do not link together. Traditionally, mind mapping begins with a central image or concept in the middle of a blank page or landscape. From there, images, words, and ideas are added using branch-like connections to the central concept. Major ideas connect directly while secondary thoughts and considerations branch out from those. So why exactly is mind mapping so much more beneficial than traditional brainstorming? First, mind mapping enables you and your team to save time by only writing relevant words and avoiding painstakingly long documents and note taking. Second, mind mapping provides clarity by linking categories and ideas as the team brainstorms, organizes, and progresses with a project. Third, mind mapping makes responsibilities and timelines easier to understand and remember when they are represented visually. Lastly, mind mapping uncovers important Factors, especially during the planning phase of a project, that are often gotten since the brain is not hung up on organization and is allowed to let it all out. Also consider using a software program design, especially for mind mapping, as it can be very helpful during this process. These programs often enable you and your team to mind map directly into a Gantt chart or an outline, which can eliminate a step when organizing information to present to stakeholders.
Okay, so you can also uh, download, uh, there are many uh, applications available. Uh, you can download them uh, for mind mapping. Uh, it is very helpful to you know, organize your thoughts, if you're working on a project or anything, not just for the, the subject, for even for your um, you know, study throughout the uh, program, um, you, you will find it uh, helpful to uh, organize your thoughts. Okay, and here these are some of the applications also. Uh, MindView, for example, is an application that converts uh, the mind mapping. Remember this one? Yeah. This is created by MindView. You can draw this mind mapping diagram and then it will automatically uh, convert it to this form of uh, work background structure and Gantt chart. Okay, and this is the uh, on the right here. You have the project uh, Gantt chart, Microsoft Project Gantt chart. This is what you are using now in the practical sessions. But this is the older version. We are using the newer version. Okay, now um, we we talked about the uh, work background structure dictionary and uh, how it is uh, helpful because things are vague when it's written in just two or three words you need something specific something rich in uh, information so that the users can easily work with uh, these items and accomplish them and therefore we create the dictionary the wbs dictionary here an example of one of these uh, items uh, that you saw earlier in the, the mind mapping or in the Gantt chart there. Um, this is one item only. And you can see that you start with um, having uh, any, uh, the, the title of the, or the name of that task. Okay. Uh, sorry, the, the project uh, title. And here you have the, the item name or the task name with the uh, item number. 2.2. So if you go back here, you will see that 2.2. Oh, it's here. Should be uh, upgrade database. Oh, so it's here about this. You can see here this upgrade database. Okay. So this is two. This is 2.1. This is 2.2. Okay. Upgrade database to be somewhere here. Okay, this is two. So this this is one. And then I think there is yeah. This is two point two. Okay. Um. So hey, this um dictionary entry shows uh, any lots of uh, information about this. Uh, for example, I don't know if this. Uh, um, yani, uh, the department maintains an online database of hardware and software on the corporate intranet. However, however we need to <coughs> make sure that we, we know exactly the hardware. The, and so yani, it gives good description about how things are managed in this, in this database. It's an online database. Things are managed in this way. Okay, and then because you're going to update it, so you need to understand what is this database and how we can update it. Then it gives here more information about uh, how this task will be uh, done. So it will involve viewing the information, uh, producing reports. And so it gives more details. It's not just like this. Even when it comes at the end here, you will see that it will also give you, uh, see, completing this task is dependent on WBS item number 2.1. So this also gives you some information that you know that you cannot start this um, item uh, unless you are done from 2.1. It also gives you that you, uh, after finishing this, you need to do the item number 3.0, which is acquiring the hardware and software. So here, this dictionary entry gives good information, comprehensive, that any user who's going to work on this task can have a good understanding of the task and he can also refer to the department mentioned here for example the IT department if he needs more bad details 
and he knows what is has to, what has to be done before and what has to be done after his work so this is an example and you do this for the whole breakdown structure about for large projects you need to have these because remember when i gave you the example of these um uh, uh the the world trade center we have here uh um the uh when the engineers um went into the uh like a like a, a boat or some kind of a party on, on a boat and then it sank this was in 2006 i think or 2007 and it sank and the engineers died um and then the project yani what will happen to the project if all these uh sank in the sea so the because they have things documented like this then they just replace these engineers with other engineers and they continued and the, then the uh, project was yani accomplished and uh, now it's running smoothly so this is this is any yani, very important part um then the fifth process is validating scope validating scope uh, is uh, another important uh, uh, yani process or a step in the uh, scope management um because um when you develop the scope statement uh, and also the work vector structure uh, you depend on what you understand and what you um, think that things are going to happen or this is what the user expected uh, but later on if you continue on this scope without going back to the user and getting his uh, feedback or acceptance on this then you have a problem at the end of the project therefore we do this validation so that we let users be involved and um, look at what is the end outcome that you are going to get because we have detailed uh, aspects of the scope uh, documented so they will um, accept it formally and they will sign it okay and they will accept these and throughout the project you need also to uh, get them uh, yani uh, look at the deliverables and sign off each of the deliverables um, delivered okay uh, until the end of the project time so acceptance is often achieved by a customer inspection and then sign off on key deliverables the last process is controlling the scope controlling the scope is basically controlling all the changes that might happen throughout the project life cycle any change that will happen to the scope need to be as we mentioned earlier you need to go take it through the proper channels the proper procedure to do this so but before that you also need to influence the factors that cause these changes yani you don't always wait until the change start or the, the change is uh, requested maybe in some cases you can influence these the factors that originating these you can uh, stop this by just a small conversation or a small chat with the with the owners or with the, so anyone who's um, yeah, involved in this change maybe you don't need to do this change okay and uh, yeah, in projects practically you need to stop changes because changes are not good for the project because it will extend the time or it will uh, yeah, increase the budget or and it's it's a distraction okay so you need to as much as you can to avoid it now saying this doesn't mean that we don't want the changes because there are many changes are good for the project but yeah you need to look at these changes that are not good for the project that's not um, worth to uh, do it then you try to influence them from the beginning not to even start the process of uh, asking for that change but if these are fine yeah valid um, points or valid changes then we need to ensure that it goes through the procedure that we mentioned earlier about the ccb okay uh, and you also ensure that everything is integrated 
يعني it's not just the this if you change the scope then definitely definitely this will affect the time and the budget of the course so you need to also ensure that the change is um, studied from all the uh, aspects and also to ensure that if the changes are accepted okay and approved then you have to ensure that it is managed properly sometimes they get the approval but or on these changes but the changes are not happened they didn't perform them so you need to manage the, this performance you need to ensure that they perform them and they perform them in a in a right way that they do not affect the uh, uh, progress of the project okay uh, this is a, a key word here the variance variance is basically the difference between anything that is it was planned and the actual performance so you have a plan and this can be applied not just for the scope for the scope for the time for the for the budget we always have a plan a budget then we have actual expenses so this is actual performance how much you spend okay yeah we budgeted 100 but you spent 50 okay or you budgeted 100 and you spent 150 so you you exceeded the budget so this is the, the difference is the called the variance even in time this task needs three days to complete according to the plan you took four days so there is a variance of one day this is extra or you completed before that so it's in two days so you have also again one day extra so this is the uh, last uh, process the uh, the last uh, part of this um, presentation is the software that we use remember we talked earlier about the integration Similarly here, we also need software to help us in managing the scope management. And it will start with a very simple, basic application like word processing or maybe a spreadsheet uh, for some calculations and, the, but, and some also communication software like emails or any other web-enabled uh, uh, applications. But also, you can go for any yani, more specialized like project management software where it will help you to create the work breakdown structures the um, gantt charts we have also later on for the for the time and cost we'll have also like the network diagrams and others so th this uh, application is uh, very useful for the project managers in some cases we need specialized software uh, such as the uh, mind mapping and some other um, maybe you need some kind of like technical um, any uh, technical specifications and these require uh, some technical calculations and these cannot be done manually or using spreadsheet you need to have a, an application specialized application that will do for you the calculations like for example for example the for the pharmaceutical industry if you are uh, producing um, uh, a drug or a vaccine so the COVID-19 vaccine or something like this these require very sophisticated uh, calculations and uh, the dose is, is yani measured very precisely and you need some some kind of any yani, special uh, application to handle this so this will be helpful so that's the end of this uh, chapter we covered the six processes uh, the def definition of the scope management, the collection of the uh, requirements, defining the scope, creating work background structure, validating the scope, and also to ensure that the changes are managed properly so we know we have the controlling of the scope. So that's it for today.